Uh, she may just need a moment. Uh, you might. Yeah, I might need. I just need a moment. Hold on. Right. Okay. So uh, we're live. Um, hello and welcome to MedNews Week conference, where our goal is to bring you to the most cutting edge information. from med med Medicine's Global Leaders. I'm Pallavi, a fourth year medical student uh, at Tbilisi State Medical University, Tbilisi, Georgia, and I will be your host today. Before we begin, I want to first acknowledge the great team that helps to make these events a reality. Our founders are two internationally recognized researchers, Dr. Yan Lefman and Chandler Park, who is also at, a president of Kentucky ASCO. Our chairs include Dr. Park, Dr. Lefman, and Pratyusha Ghanta. Our organizing com committee is comprised of Alexandra Van de uh, and Dr. Ewa Sule. Our managers include William uh, Wilkinson, Muskan Joshi, Pallavi, and Gayatri. Um, our educational committee includes Sean, Amarel, uh, Shubha Pawar, Janvi Shah, Madhuri Bal, Subramaniam, uh, Chorya Harshal, and Astanai. The moderator for today's event is Shrivika. Uh, now to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Sanjay Reddy. Dr. Reddy is co-director Marvin uh, and Con Concetta Greenberg Pancreatic Cancer Institute. Uh, just, just give me a minute, all right? There's, an, uh, there's a technical problem. Um, so uh, the code, as as I as I said, Dr. Reddy is the co-director of Marvin Gay, uh, Marvin and uh, Consetta Greenberg Pancreatic Institute, associate program director, complex general surgical oncology fellowship, and associate professor, surg uh, surgical oncology at Fox Chase Center, uh, Temple University Health Systems. With that, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Reddy. The floor is yours. I apologize for the echo because uh, there was some technical issue. I'm I'm really sorry. Uh, that's quite right. Uh, thank you, uh, everybody, for uh, inviting me to talk today. Um, you know, November is a special month in the world of pancreas. Uh, it's Pancreatic Cancer Awareness Month. And, you know, the, the tough part of pancreatic cancer is uh, when you look at the other cancers, and we'll talk about this during the talk today, you know, I titled my talk, Are We Making a Dent in This Nihilistic Attitude? The reason is, is that there is hope for this disease. And um, as you'll learn today, my hope for everyone out there is to understand that we are making strides. Even though the needles are moving in small increments, we're making positive moves here. I have, oh, why is this not, no, hold on. I have no disclosures, except I have a five and a two-year-old at home and they played in some part um, the slides today. So there will be some, uh, funny um, movie clips and, um, and, and uh, little images throughout the uh, presentation to make it somewhat exciting. Um, so we're gonna just go over some objectives today. So basic facts, in order for you to understand the disease, you have to understand the facts. Uh, I think because the audience is so wide and global, um, I'd like to go over some anatomy of the pancreas so people understand kind of what I see as a surgeon on a day-to-day -day basis. One of the key areas that we have to discuss is sort of definition of resectability. The tough part about pancreas cancer is the staging has, can be very confusing and challenging to understand. And this is gonna really kind of highlight the best ways to look at it. My area and where I've dedicated the majority of my research and um, my career is in these neoadjuvant clinical trials where we utilize therapies before surgery um, to sort of maximize outcomes of these pancreatic tumors. Then I'd like to dive into some of our own data. Uh, I've been at Fox Chase now for 10 years, and we've uh, culminated a series of, of, of interesting data to sort of support the things that we do, and then we'll have some conclusions. So the first part of the talk is somewhat somber. Um, you'll see here a number of new cases and deaths per 100,000, 12 in men, 10.9 um, in women, Lifetime risk of developing this disease is 1.6% will be diagnosed during their lifetime. In 2015 alone, in the United States, almost 70,000 people um, were ailed with this disease. 
When you look at the numbers of all new cancer cases in 2018, 3.2%. It's not a trivial number. And then all of, of all cancer deaths, almost 7%. So again, when you look at the curves, and this is from SEER data, you see that the new cases are on the incline. Deaths have been sort of stable throughout the years. And the reason the new cases are on the incline is that people are being much more sort of cognizant of this disease, whether it be from um, you know, famous people developing the disease um, and it, you know, being out there more in the mainstream media, but it definitely has, has captured a lot of the attention of the general public. When you look at the numbers still, uh, and again, this number is a little bit dated now, but when I started my practice 10 years ago, it was 5%, 8.5%. We are finally moving this needle to a double digit number for, for, for survival. Um, and again, it's those small needle moves and increments in that needle that are, are making a big difference. And the challenge really ends up being is that the majority of these patients present, as you see here, with distant disease, right? 52% will present with metastatic disease, whereas um, regional and localized disease is usually where I can sort of intervene um, is far less. And you can see the five-year survival is directly related to when patients present. So those with regional or localized disease, the five-year survivals are better, obviously, than those with distant disease. When you look at the common types of cancer, breast, lung, prostate, colorectal, pancreatic cancer is number 11. And again, this is rapidly moving up the list of, 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 of cancers that we're paying more mind and attention to. You know, this disease doesn't discriminate against age. Um, I've done Whipple's on, and pancreatectomies on patients as young as 30 um, to as old as 80. And the median age uh, can be anywhere, you know, in the 70s range, but again, the spectrum of, of, of people that are, that are affected by this disease is, um, is wide. And again, this is probably the most important slide of my facts where you can actually see the five-year survival is moving up. And the reason is not because of any advances in surgical techniques, dare I say. I think it's really the fact that we're utilizing a lot of therapies to treat the disease, chemotherapy, radiation, and the combination of all these therapies to help combat this disease. So a little bit of anatomy. I think one of the most important parts of understanding the pancreas is the anatomy is quite difficult oftentimes to um, understand. And again, I think there's a lot of students out there and uh, medical providers in, in some capacity that may not be in surgery. I think understanding the anatomy will, will, will clear the air as to sort of why we do things and what we do. So this is just a basic picture, right, of the pancreas. And you can see here, this is the pancreatic head. This lies within the, the, the loop of the duodenum. And you have the uncentered process, which is the comma part of the, the pancreas. And you can see on the slide where the second arrow is down here, the location of tumors in this location can oftentimes be very close to the veins and the arteries over here, which can sometimes make surgery challenging. Then you have the pancreatic neck, which is over here. And you can, again, appreciate that when you have tumors in the neck of the gland, how close it is to the interface of this vein. So we're talking about a space that's really, really, really confined. Then you have the pancreatic body, and then lastly, the pancreatic tail. So each section of the gland is almost like a, a complete different operation. As you move here, this is a great picture to just sort of see how the vessels are intimately involved with this gland. So again, you can see the portal vein just lies right behind here. And when you have tumors that are in these locations, you can see how challenging um, surgery can be because of invasion into these vessels. And again, over here, the celiac trunk over here, and you can see when we have body tumors, this uh, vessel is oftentimes um, at risk. This is just a, a brief video where you can kind of see here um, some anatomy. So this is your common hepatic artery over here. This is your GDA. This is your bile duct. And this is why anatomy is so important. Right behind this bile duct here, over here, is a replaced right hepatic artery. So again, every case is so different and understanding the anatomy prior to diving in is so important um, because these critical structures are oftentimes at risk. Um, and if it's not known beforehand what's going on, it could be dangerous. Um, and in the next sort of, oh, sorry, let me see. Next video here, you see we've divided the bile duct over here, 
And you can see the replaced right hepatic vessel running over here. So again, critical to understand the anatomy in these, in these types of cases. This is probably one of the most sort of textbook pictures that you'll see where we've tunneled underneath the gland of the pancreas. Now, everything to the uh, left of your, or the, the top part of your screen is coming out. Everything to the bottom part of your screen is staying in. And this is that, you know, that magic tunnel that we do where the portal vein is directly beneath, <coughs> which allows then for the tumor to come out. Again, anatomy, anatomy, anatomy. This is the lip from the transverse colon up, following the veins down. The wonderful thing about surgery is that by and large, more often than not, the anatomy is the same every single time until it's not. So understanding that really gives you the, the superior edge to um, try to get these tumors out. Here you can see we've now divided the gland and right in the middle is a portal vein. You know, this is a, a, an interesting clip because what you see to the top part of your screen over here, this is oftentimes where vessel invasion will occur and where tumors will be involving this vein, which can make a surgery a little bit more challenging. This sort of nicely leads me to my next sort of uh, focus is definition of resectability. How do you define this disease, right? And you have tumors that are resectable, which means that they're removable. Then you have what we call borderline resectable disease. And this is where I've, I've committed a lot of my research in, where the tumors are kind of up against and kissing the veins and the arteries. And then you have locally advanced disease where tumors are sort of wrapped around those vessels. So why is resectability so important? Well, I'll tell you. By and large, 20 to 25% of patients will present with resectable cancers. So the vast majority of patients presenting with tumors that are abutting, involving the veins, et cetera. And what we know is that if you have a margin positive resection, that's called an R1 or an R2 resection, you do poorly. So the goal is, is how do you maximize an R0 or complete composite resection? This is why defining the resectability is so important. <clears throat> when you look at this slide here, you can see here, patients with positive margin resections, look at their median survival. They're poor, right? Compared to those that undergo margin negative resection. So again, now yes, one could argue that if you're having a positive margin resection, that the biology is worse, the tumors are more advanced. I agree, I don't disagree with that, but what do you do about it? So how do you classify this, right? So there's three buckets we look at, right? There's resectable, there's locally advanced, unresectable, and there's metastatic. We need to, for the, for the, for the purposes of this talk, remove the metastatic patient from this list because that's a whole separate sort of uh, discussion. So you have these two buckets, right? You have your resectable patients, your locally advanced patients, and this is the area where I think needs the most attention, right? It's this distinction of borderline resectable disease that drives a lot of the care in pancreatic cancer. So this is one of my favorite slides. Where do we draw the line in borderline resectable PDAC? What you see here is at least right now four definitions each of which are completely different in defining pancreatic cancer resectability. One of the tried and tested um, uh, definitions is the MD Anderson group in 2006 uh, published these guidelines. And it was the real first solid attempt in defining this vague category of borderline resectable disease. And very simply, they combined them as resectable, borderline and locally advanced. And you can see here the terminology. So, Superior mesenteric artery, we just saw that on the anatomy slide. Tumor abutment of less than 180 degrees is considered borderline resectable disease. Celiac or, or, or hepatic artery, short segment encasement, borderline resectable disease. For the SMV, short segment occlusion, borderline resectable disease. Another definition, and I want you to pay note of these specific words. Impingement and narrowing, borderline resectable disease. NCCN guidelines, distortion or narrowing, borderline resectable disease. Encasement, direct abutment. The common trend up until this point is that what's distortion to me may not be distortion to someone else. So you're inaccurately categorizing patients into borderline resectable disease 
because there's no consensus on how you stage these patients, right? So to, 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 the, you know, to the NCCN kind of understanding this, this, this dilemma in 2018, they actually, for the first time, added some more you know, direct language. So what you see here in pancreatic cancer, you say borderline susceptible disease, solid tumor contact, less than 180 degrees of the SMA, right? So here for the first time, we see that they're applying more direct um, uh, numbers to kind of help clarify this. For the vein, you can see here, they're saying solid tumor contact of over 180 degrees is borderline, less than 180 degrees with contour irregular. So there's still some you know, bias here that the operating surgeon can potentially um, use to say they think it's borderline versus not. And of note, they also finally included body and tail lesions because we see a lot of patients with tumors in the body and tail of the pancreas. <clears throat> this is another definition, the alliance definition, which again, very similar to the NCCN guidelines, uh, mentioned specific uh, interfaces uh, of vein involvement to help determine what the definition would be. Uh, again, 180 degrees of the vein, um, short segment of the artery, and the SMA of 180. You know, when you look at the receptability for pancreatic cancer, there's other criteria that need to sort of, you know, be circulated in your head. And one of them is, and this is what the MD Anderson group did, is they, they classify these into type A, B, and C. And type A is your typical sort of based on imaging, right? But what about nodal status, right? So what if you have a CT scan that shows lymph nodes? We know those patients are a little bit more high risk, right? And what about the patients that are just terrible operative candidates, right? These type C patients, are you going to take them straight for a Whipple? You got to be careful here. And I think this definition sort of adds another layer to what we need to sort of think about. And again, this is just a nice picture to kind of see what this means. So abutment is when the veins are just sort of kissing on the, uh, the uh, tumors are just kissing on the veins. And then casement obviously is when it's much more advanced. So almost 12 years ago, our group here at Fox Chase looked at this idea of defining venous involvement for this borderline resectable category. And this is a study we wrote here where we looked at what we call Ishikawa staging. And, and what Ishikawa staging is, it's, it's ways for us to look at the imaging and decide on the degree of vessel involvement on the imaging study to determine what's happening. So what we found here is that patients that received preoperative therapy lived longer, right? Um, but what was interesting is when you got preoperative chemo radiation, you had a higher R0 resection rate. So what that means is that with preoperative therapy, we're affecting those margin negative resections. And if you look at this uh, next slide here, you'll see um, the higher Ishikawa stage. Again, Ishikawa stage is two, three, four, and five. And the higher you go, the more vessel involvement on imaging that you see, the more chance you had of needing a vein resection. And when you look at survival, you'll see here for the Ishikawa on table A, one to three, the survival was much better than those with Ishikawa types four and five. So yes, half the game is sort of understanding the biology of the disease, but also understanding your limitations when it comes to um, operating on patients with significant vessel involvement. Now, 10 years later, um, when, I, when I got here, um, we looked at this exact same question and, and we asked ourselves, can we use preoperative vascular grading to help determine who's gonna have a positive margin. And this picture you see on the bottom really depicts nicely the Ishikawa staging. So normal, a smooth shift, a unilateral narrowing, bilateral narrowing, and bilateral narrowing with collateral veins. And you can see here in our study that Ishikawa was strongly associated with a positive SMA and SMB margin. And again, it makes sense, right? If you can predict on your imaging, which one of these categories you fall into, the higher chance you have of having a positive margin. And this is what you know, this data from our, from our center showed. So I've spent the past 10 minutes or so talking about vascular staging, right? So is that the true staging for pancreatic cancer? Absolutely not. And this is where there's a lot of back and forth in the literature because the AJCC is our sort of benchmark cancer staging for all of our cancers, breast, colon, 
uh, head and neck cancers. And if you look at the um, AJCC staging, not anywhere does it mention the details of the vascular staging. By and large, you see here T3 without involvement of the celiac or SMA, T4 involves a celiac or the SMA. What about the vein? What about abutment? What about the, the degrees of abutment? So we should all be sitting here right now thinking what the heck is going on with this because we have a definition of vascular susceptibility that's so important for the surgeons and the oncologists to decide what therapy to give a patient, but there's no consensus in how these are defined. This leads us into sort of the, the, the heart of the talk here of neoadjuvant trials. This space is so important. This space is, is, is where, again, a lot of um, developing uh, data has been emerging um, to support the use of neoadjuvant therapy in, in pancreatic cancer. Because if you look at it, and, and, and again, this is a whole separate hour-long talk, the standard approach for a long time was adjuvant chemotherapy, right? Patients get surgery, and then they get adjuvant chemo. And when you look at the data, you know, a Whipple is not a trivial pursuit. This is a big operation. And it can be anywhere from 60% of people are too ill after a Whipple to get chemotherapy. So the rationale is, do we give the therapy up front so we maximize that potential? Now, <clears throat> I can't ask anyone on this call, but who this gentleman is. This is Blake Cady. He's an American surgical oncologist, and he was actually our society's president uh, in the late 80s. And he eloquently said this phrase, which I, I really hope everyone will understand and take, take to heart. Tumor biology is king, selection is queen, and technical maneuvers are the princes and princesses trying to usurp the throne, sometimes with temporary apparent victories and usually to no long-term avail, right? So this highlights the fact that tumor biology is king. Yes, I could do a pull on anybody, but if the biology is not behaving well, is it worthwhile to put that patient through that kind of an operation? And that's a big debate in the, in the surgical literature and the surgical world. So what is the point of neoadjuvant therapy? There's a couple of things that it does. It provides this time where we can gauge the aggressiveness of the disease, right? So a, a, an opportunity for us to sort of see the biology of the disease. Yes, we're selecting patients who have stable or responding disease. We treat early micrometastatic disease. We downstage to maximize the goal for an R0 resection. Again, <clears throat> from the beginning of my slides, you saw that our goal is to achieve a complete resection of the, of the, of the tumor with no residual disease left behind. Doug Evans, a mentor to many of, of, uh, of the contemporary surgeons, um, put together in the early 90s this really sort of novel approach to pancreatic cancer. And for the first time, he termed this potentially resectable disease, right? So we're starting now to understand this idea even back in the early 90s. And all these patients have pancreatic cancer and their rationale was to give them chemo radiation for five and a half weeks and see what happened. And one of the first major myths was disproved. All of these patients completed their therapy. People said, well, why would I wanna give somebody chemotherapy and radiation before surgery? They're not gonna be fit enough to have surgery afterwards. Well, they were. And when you look at the toxicities, by and large, they were pretty acceptable in the general um, population of, of patients in this cohort. And the one thing that it also added, this, this sort of um, landmark study, was it for the first time looked at a grading system for treatment effect. So what we know is that when you deliver preoperative therapy, the tumors will start dying. And what we found at our center is that when you have more tumor kill, the better the survival of the patients will be. And you can also see here, the margin negative resection was far superior in these patient cohorts. So, this suggests that we can do these operations safely after chemoradiation, they can tolerate their therapy, and all therapy can be given. Huge landmark here. This led to a couple of years later, this is my mentor, John Hoffman. Um, John Hoffman was a, a leader uh, in pancreatic cancer at this center at Fox Chase, and I took over his practice in, in 2012. 
Um, I still talk to Dr. Hoffman pretty much on a weekly basis, and um, he's still very much involved in a lot of my research um, and, and manuscript that I'll write. But he hypothesized in, in that time frame also, let's give her the let's give the adjuvant therapy that we were giving after before and see what happens, right? And what was interesting is in, in, in Dr. Hoffman's sort of pilot fox chase study, what they found was that the median survival time, survival from time of diagnosis uh, was 45 months. This was like a breakthrough here in the neoadjuvant space. And what this led to is probably one of the most important things in clinical trial research is a phase two cooperative group study. So because of Dr. Hoffman's pursuits in the, in the mid nineties, this led to a prospective multi-institutional randomized trial um, looking at, or sorry, clinical trial, phase two trial, looking at patients that were gonna undergo preoperative chemo radiation. This all sounds great, right? You're gonna see what the pitfalls were in one minute. So again, overall toxicities were acceptable in this clinical trial. But when you look at the curves, something happened here. So the median overall survival was five, eight, and 15 months. So what the heck? I mean, how did this happen? How could you three years before have a trial which showed 45%, a 45 month survival and now all of a sudden go to this? Well, what was interesting in this study was that <clears throat> while we found it safe to give therapy, patients were entered in the study with far advanced tumors because there's no definition, right? We did a poor job in defining who had borderline resectable disease. And that was the goal of this study to treat those patients in the middle category. So this is why definitions are so important. And when you look at the studies in the early 90s, you'll see across the board here, median survival anywhere from nine months to 37 or to, to 23 months. And um, again, many of these sort of neoadjuvant therapy patients were included in resectables marginally resectable, locally advanced. And I think this really confounds the reports um, of these early clinical trials. So in 2013, when I was a fellow here, we wrote a letter to the editors. How do we define this disease, right? Where do we draw the line in borderline resectable disease? And it really sort of, at that point in time in the, in, in the mid 2000s, gained a lot of momentum and traction in this field. When you look at this slide, it's a busy slide, but what I wanna highlight here is, look how many definitions we're using to define resectability. NCC in 2008, NCC in 2005, 2010, the AHPBA definition, the MD Anderson definition. I mean, if there's no uniformity in definition, how can you possibly design a real clinical trial? And you can see here, a plethora of different sort of staging uh, based on the individual um, uh, resectability criteria that we used. So we had this epiphany, right? We had this idea as sort of, well, what do we do at this point, right? What chemotherapies are good in the neoadjuvant setting? How do you define the disease, et cetera? You know, as with a lot of cancers, we extrapolate data, right? So this is probably a landmark protege trial that looked at metastatic pancreatic cancer patients, right? So we said in this group, you see here, median overall survival was 11 months in the Fulfirinox group compared to six months in the GEM group. And you see clear separation of the curves on the table to the right. So we thought, all right, well, if it works in the metastatic world, can we deliver this new adjuvant therapy in the, you know, in the surgical world or the non-metastatic world? And this led to one of the, pivotal sort of clinical trials in pancreatic cancer in the neoadjuvant space. And again, it was a very simple design. Fulfirinox, radiation, surgery, chemo, follow, right? And what they found in this early pilot study was, was novel stuff. Enhanced R0 resection rates, enhanced tumor kill. And what this did is this led to one of the, uh, in my opinion, one of the pivotal trials in pancreatic cancer and Fox Chase enrolled several patients in this clinical trial. And again, the trial design was pretty much randomizing patients to arm one and arm two, where you had fulfirinox, more chemo, and then surgery or radiation. Because one of the biggest sort of 
confusing areas in pancreatic cancer was, is there a role for radiation, right? We know this disease is systemic at the onset by and large. So does radiation really kind of help make the decisions of what to do? While this was an important study design, the schema is important, what this trial also did was this. It took three definitions, moved them to the side, and they made their own definition. So this trial had very, very strict criteria um, using specific degree of vessel involvement to determine what a patient was resectable or borderline resectable. So they really understood this idea of defining the disease before you enrolled on clinical trials. And uh, this was about 126, 126 patients, <clears throat> started in 2016 and uh, completed in 2020. And the results were recently released just last year uh, uh, in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. And again, just to refresh, arm A was chemo only, arm B was chemo radiation. All patients received additional chemotherapy afterwards. What's really interesting here, and there's so much debate in, in med Twitter uh, on this specific topic, um, our, you know, the arm A, 93% 18 month overall survival versus 78% in arm B, median uh, follow-up was 27, 31 months, and the overall survival was found to be poor in arm B. And this caused a storm of controversy. It's just sort of why, why all of a sudden now are we saying that radiation is actually harmful to patients? Well, there's a lot of sort of, again, debate in, in this sort of um, um, question. And, you know, one of the biggest sort of thing that they talked about was the radiation that was delivered in this uh, clinical trial was using stereotactic radiation as opposed to traditional external beam radiation. And maybe that played a role. Nonetheless, the overall sort of consensus from this clinical trial was that chemotherapy resulted in favorable overall survival. Now, hypofraction of radiation did not improve survival. And this has now led to a whole sort of, um, you know, separate um, um, talkings of, of, of additional clinical trials to sort of investigate this. So we wrote this paper here, myself and Dr. Hoffman in 2016, where we argued, what about for resectable pancreatic cancer, right? What about for tumors that we know are resectable? Forget about borderline and locally advanced, <clears throat> but is there an argument or a disadvantage to giving neoadjuvant chemotherapy in resectable patients? Big debate, right? This is just like, you know, how do you sort of define, how do you justify giving somebody with a tumor that can come out chemotherapy or radiation up front? Well, in 2020, um, Dr. Saeed, um, sorry, Saeed Ahmad at uh, Cincinnati asked this exact question. And this was the SWOG 1505 study that we also participated in. And it was a very simple design. They looked at the two backbone regimens in pancreatic cancer, fulfirinox and gemcitabine, and they just went head to head. And the results were actually quite interesting. The median overall survival was 22 and 23 months. There was no statistical significance. And when you look at the arms here, they were very well matched between the both um, fulfirinox and the gemcitabine arm. So would we say this is a failure of a clinical trial? Absolutely not. Because what it showed is two-year overall survival, 41% with fulfirinox and 48% with gemcitabine. While there was no difference between the two arms, we've showed staggering survival benefits with neoadjuvant chemotherapy in the resectable space. So that is what the take home is here. And what you can also say is that technically in the neoadjuvant setting, both regimens sort of work, work pretty well. This led to, again, a very recent sort of uh, publication called the Preopank trial. And this was a phase three trial that looked at randomly assigning patients to a neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy or upfront surgery. So this is an interesting trial because again, um, this included resectable and borderline resectable patients. And one could argue upfront surgery and borderline resectable is not necessarily the best option, but again, it's still the standard of care um, in many cases. And what they found here is, um, I'll show you here, those that underwent and what's interesting here is if you had neoadjuvant chemo radio, uh, chemo radiotherapy, 61% underwent resection. So I asked people, and I know you can't respond, but that means 40% of people did not. That means 40% of people would have went to surgery, 
and they would have either closed, been unable to resect the tumor, and that would have been, uh, in my opinion, a failure. So we saved this many people from undergoing a surgery that may not have been particularly helpful. And what you also see here, as opposed to upfront surgery, is if you got the preoperative therapy, your margin resection negative rate was 72% as opposed to 43%. And the real kicker, 20% versus six and a half percent survival. So Preopank really showed us, and this is long-term results, that the use of neoadjuvant therapy is substantially better than those in the upfront surgery group. Now, this is going to be um, data that's coming out soon, the Preopank 2 study, um, which looks to randomize patients to neoadjuvant fulfirinox, which again was arm A in the Alliance trial, um, followed by surgery without adjuvant treatment versus kind of a chemo radiation arm. So this is another sort of trial trying to compare and see, you can see the schema here um, of, 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 what's, of what's sort of happening and going on. Um, so we should feel pretty good about ourselves, right? We, we, we've talked about sort of new adjuvant trials, um, um, understanding kind of what the rationale is. And now I'm gonna kind of just focus the talk and kind of twist the talk a little bit on some of our own data. Because to really understand this, you have to sort of look deep into your own sort of institutional practices and understand what's going on. So this is gonna be some Fox Chase Cancer Center data, which I'll go over uh, now. So I like this slide because it shows kind of Fox Chase beating up pancreatic cancer. Um, and, you know, we've had a long story tradition here at the center, again, really culminating from the efforts of Dr. Hoffman on the use of new adjuvant therapy for pancreatic cancer. Um, and again, um, we're going to go over some of our own data. So this is recently published data that we just published, I think, uh, this year, where we looked at our own total neoadjuvant therapy experience. So total neoadjuvant therapy is the, the ability to deliver chemotherapy, radiation, and then ultimately surgery. And you can see here through the stages, you stage chemotherapy, stage radiation, stage surgery. You see the word staging multiple times in the slide because it is so important to not take somebody to surgery if they have disease that is either you know, micro or, or, or metastatic at the time of the surgery. And this was sort of our schema here. And you can see we have surgery first, and then we have the TNT group. And then there's this interesting group that we call SMNT, single modality neoadjuvant therapy. Those are patients that either are getting chemo radiation or chemo alone. And that cohort of patients was studied in our, in our, um, in our cohort. And this is sort of a busy slide, but by and large, the, the bottom line is <clears throat> there's no significant, uh, you can see just the basic demographics here. Here, you'll see the NCCN resectability classification. You, you'll see here that the majority of patients, 71% um, to be specific, um, had borderline resectable disease in the TNT group. When we looked at CA, um, clinical stage, you'll also see that the higher clinical stage, those patients were getting randomized, or not randomized, but placed in the TNT group. So yes, there's 100% selection bias here, but this just shows just some, some, some data. Um, when we looked at CA199, interestingly enough, there was no significance. And what we know, a lot of studies out there are saying that response to CA199 actually has shown um, a significant sort of effect, um, but unfortunately our data didn't sort of corroborate that. When you look at sort of specific regimens here, and what's interesting to note on this slide is that who received adjuvant chemo? So what you see here, and again, in the surgery first group, 70% received adjuvant chemo. That goes in line with the literature, right? 30% then didn't. So that's a lot. That's a lot of people that for whatever complication may have occurred, et cetera, they were too weak etc. they could not get their adjuvant therapy. So again, that does sort of carry some weight here. When you look at those that we've downstaged, in those that got chemo or the total new adjuvant therapy, 65% of patients in our cohort got downstaged. And the real sort of um, highlight here is R0 resection. 70 or 86% R0 resection rate in our cohort um, that received uh, total new adjuvant therapy. And when you look at the survival curves, I mean, this says it all, 
right? The TNT survival curves clearly separate from that of the surgery first and the single modality therapy. When you look at, because we were just curious, if you got adjuvant therapy in the surgery first group, yes, you did better. But again, 70% got adjuvant therapy, 30% did not. And that, that is not a trivial number. When you look at, does it benefit patients to get adjuvant therapy after total new adjuvant therapy? And in our cohort, it didn't. So we gave the, the lion's share of the chemo up front. And when you didn't get adjuvant chemotherapy, what we found in our TNT group is that there was significance in terms of survival. So one thing that we really sort of, I'd like to highlight here is we talked about that fibrosis and our center really sort of was a pioneer also looking at a fibrosis. And you can see here in the total new adjuvant therapy group, 80% had um, um, uh, fibrosis versus that of 70% in the single group. This idea of a complete pathologic response, we had a 10% complete path response. So what does that mean? That means that in 10% of our cohort, there was no visible tumor left. So when you look at that and how that translates into numbers, median survival from diagnosis in our cohort was 42 months. Median survival from operation, the TNT group was 33 months. Median survival, if you had a path CR, 100.2 months. That's staggering in pancreas cancer. Um, and I think this just shows you that how do you achieve a path CR, right? You got to give therapy upfront. That's the only way you're going to achieve a path CR. Now, our group also looked at, and uh, this was my fellow, Dr. Barak, we published um, an NCDB sort of analysis looking at this exact question. And what we found is that if you achieved a path CR, you had significant overall survival benefit as compared to those who did not. So again, we reaffirmed that idea. So this leads to the big question is radiation versus no radiation again, right? We had talked about this in, in, in a few slides before and our group in 2021 or 2022 published this data that looked to evaluate the significance. And this is a very simple question. We asked, all right, if you have a positive surgical margin and you got chemo rads, Versus if you had upfront surgery and you had a positive margin, what happened, right? So pretty much what we found is that if you had a positive margin after new adjuvant chemo radiation, you had longer survival with patients with a positive margin from upfront surgery. So are we cheating a little bit? Perhaps. Um, but if you get the new adjuvant chemo rads, even if you had a positive margin, you're still sterilizing it in some capacity and it, and it, and it showed um, a positive benefit in this cohort. So we've now outlined this sort of series of time, right from the early nineties when we adopted new adjuvant therapy to present time. And I wanna just spend the last sort of few slides going over some actual sort of effects that we see with new adjuvant therapy. So here you see the tumor uh, in the arrow in red. And here you see the uh, superior mesenteric vein. And here you see the superior mesenteric artery. And you can see on this slide, this haziness here, right? There's tumor involving the vein and abutting the artery. This patient got total new adjuvant therapy. And you can see here now, tumor, that hypodense area is resolved. The vein interface is open. And the artery is now completely clear. So we've taken this patient to surgery, rendered them an R0 resection. This patient, you can see here, has a tumor now in the neck slash body of the pancreas. And you, can, and you can sort of subtly see this vein is being impinged here and kind of narrowed in some capacity. Following treatment, you can see here <clears throat> the tumor shrunk and the vein opened up. Another one. This is a body tumor. And you can see here, the um, splenic artery is completely encased very close to the confluence um, of the celiac axis. And following therapy, it shrunk. And you can see the interface between the uh, vein and the, uh, the artery here is a little bit better. This is a great picture showing an Ishikawa um, four, right? Where we have bilateral uh, vein um, narrowing here by tumor. 
And following therapy, you can see how beautifully that sort of interface opened up. Lastly, this is a gentleman that actually has a genetic mutation, a PALB2 mutation. And you can see here, very, very bulky tumor. This is all his tumor over here, abutting the vein, abutting the artery, actually coming behind the artery over here. This gentleman received preoperative chemo radiation and chemotherapy. And you can see here the response he rendered. He's now, I think, a four-year pancreatic cancer survivor. So we really kind of covered a lot of ground here in terms of the, the role for chemotherapy and new adjuvant therapy. And I really asked the audience sort of what conclusions can we draw with everything that I talked about today? And this is really an open-ended question. You will see hundreds and hundreds of studies on PubMed about chemotherapy, not doing chemotherapy. Do we do surgery first? Do we not do surgery first? And you know, I'm not here to sort of convince anybody that we're, you know, at a, at a, at a pivotal breakthrough point, although some would argue. Um, but I'd like to impart to the audience that it's not about the amount of clinical trials. It's about sort of well-designed clinical trials in the space. And the key with this cancer, as, as other cancers, is to have uniformity among specialists before we can make decisions. And we have to make better standardized clinical trials and we need more work in this space to sort of really move this needle forward. Um, this is my, my team at Fox Chase that I work with. This is uh, Igor Asetarov to the left and Eddie Kukerman to the, in the middle. Uh, Igor uh, does a lot of work uh, with PDX models and mice models. In fact, we have a pretty good PDX program here where we implant the majority of our pancreatic tumors into uh, mice. And uh, we, we grow them and we, we, we experiment with them. And Eddie Kukerman um, has a lab that looks at the microenvironment. She's a thought leader in the field of fibrosis and stroma modulation. Um, I can do a whole other talk on the lab side of, uh, of, of our research here. Um, but that sort of concludes, and these are my two girls, um, my, um, my talk for this evening. Happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Eddie, for that informative and intriguing session. GI oncology has always been such an interesting subject, and I'm sure that, like me, all the attendees today have a lot of questions for you. Therefore, I'll be passing on the mic to our moderator for uh, today's session, that is Shrivika. Shrivika, over to you. Thank you, doctor, for such an enlightening, enlightening session. It was truly educational and interesting. Thank you for coming and welcome to Discussion with Global Leaders. I'm Shrivika Kanan, and we are excited to be speaking with Dr. Sanjay Reddy. He's an internationally recognized surgeon in the areas of pancreatic cancer and the co-director in Marvin and Consita Greenberg Pancreatic Cancer Institute. We have received a lot of questions and will do our best to get through all of them in the time we have with you. For the first question, I'm going to be passing the mic back to Pallavi. Uh, so thank you again, Dr. Reddy, for that engrossing session. My question is in relation with your study on low frequency of lymph node metastasis in patients with early stage gastric cancers with, uh, you know, Japanese endoscopic resection criteria. Considering the latest advancements in technology of treatment and detection of tumors uh, and with the rapid rate at which the techniques are getting introduced, right? Uh, what are your views on incorporating uh, the use of, uh, you know, artificial intelligence along with, you know, traditional Japanese resection criteria to, you know, treat tumors in especially colorectal carcinoma or maybe adenocarcinoma? What do you think? What are your views on that? Um, so, um, so robotic surgery is something that uh, has really sort of hit the main line or mainstream in, in surgical oncology. And uh, we utilize um, robotic techniques in um, gastric cancer, uh, in colorectal cancer, in pancreatic cancer. And I do, I do a lot of pancreatic cancer surgeries uh, robotically as well. I think the benefits is it really does sort of enhance your visualization and, and sort of field of what you can see. Um, it does uh, less uh, bigger, less uh, smaller incisions and quicker recovery times, et cetera. So um, I think robotics played a big role in cancer care. Um, and, uh, I think that is something that will continue to develop and grow in terms of sort of the, you know, that, that, that paper that we had published, uh, on the, on the small gastric tumors, I think, you know, endoscopic mucosal resections of small gastric tumors are something that 
I think um, is a, a standard practice. Now, again, uh, in um, Western uh, culture, um, these cancers are oftentimes more bulky when they present, and I don't see very many small gastric tumors at presentation. So typically standard resections are more sort of favored, but when we do get the, you know, the occasional T1 gastric cancer, um, uh, endoscopic resection is a completely acceptable approach. Right. Thank you for answering my question, Dr. Eddie. I genuinely believe these advancements will have a positive impact in, uh, you know, the future of GI oncology. I would like to pass the mic over to Shrivika again. Um, thank you, Dr. Sanjay, for such a wonderful answer. So my question is, what is the type of lifestyle changes that a patient would need to undergo once they have undergone the pancreatic surgery? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, uh, that's, a, that's a tough question because pancreatic cancer surgery is, is difficult because you're essentially replumbing the entire um, body, right? Um, you're rerouting the stomach, the bile duct, the pancreas, et cetera. Patients oftentimes will have to be on some sort of a pancreatic enzyme replacement um, for the remainder of their lives. Um, they also are at a higher risk for developing ulcers. So a lot of patients are on uh, proton pump inhibitors as well. But in reality, once a patient has fully recovered, they go back to what we would consider a pretty normal diet uh, and a normal lifestyle. Um, yes, there's you know times where if they don't take their medications, they'll get bloated. They may have some you know fatty stools or steatorrhea. But by and large, patients can eat what they want to eat um, and go back to a pretty normal, healthy lifestyle. Thank you, doctor, for such a wonderful <laughs> answer. Um, so for the next question, I'm passing the mic to Gayatri. Thank you so much, Dr. Reddy, for that very enlightening session. I really learned a lot. Uh, so my question is, um, how did um, oncological treatment procedures evolve for patients with pancreatic cancer as well as a superimposed COVID-19 infection? Yeah, you know, we're actually, we're actually just looking at this now at our center. We're, we, we're, we just pulled our data. Um, you know, COVID changed uh, the uh, landscape of pancreatic cancer early on. And, you know, just with any field, I think in oncology, we were scared, right? We were scared to operate on patients because we were scared to have them in the hospital to get exposed. Um, you know, if they had developed COVID post Whipple, uh, that, that would be, you know, devastating. So what we did is we oftentimes would try to give those patients chemotherapy before surgery, again, or radiation or preoperative therapy, understanding that we're trying to minimize their risks um, for, for getting COVID. But in reality, the, the climate didn't change much because that was the standard approach that we were doing at the center anyway. Um, in reality, at a cancer center like us, we didn't really skip a beat. We had tight protocols during COVID. Um, you know, we were a COVID negative hospital. Um, where we had zero inpatients with COVID. Patients got screened prior to therapy for, uh, for COVID. Um, now, obviously, things with people being vaccinated and um, uh, things have lightened up a little bit. But during the heart of COVID, uh, we didn't really skip a beat in terms of treating patients with pancreatic cancer. Thank you, doctor, for such a wonderful answer. For the next question, I'm going to pass the mic on to Billy. Hi. So um, now I actually have a little bit of a two-parter question. The first is more, uh, what do you see, what changes do you see in the clinic remaining after the COVID pandemic? And then I'll just ask the, the second part as well. Um, can you give like sort of like your clinical perspective on some like the inequities that you see within your practice, uh, especially like in terms of access to care and what are some of the ways to best address them? Yeah, I'll answer your second question first. I think, you know, inequities to care in pancreatic cancer is, is something that is, is known. Um, you know, patients that are in under, underserved uh, areas don't have the access, right? I mean, you know, when somebody gets total neoadjuvant therapy, they're coming in. So, for example, if you're getting fulfirinox as neoadjuvant therapy, you're coming in once every two weeks to get an infusion. You go home with a pump, uh, and that lasts for three months. Um, then you have to get radiation for five and a half weeks every day, come to the center for 20 minutes at a time to get your treatment. Um, patients that lack support, that lack travel, 
that um, you know lack all those sort of abilities to get those therapies oftentimes don't get the care they need. And um, you know, I think that is an area that um, needs work. And I know here at Fox Chase, you know, our partner hospital is Temple Hospital, and um, we've are working in, with ways to sort of enhance their um, transportation issues, um, access to care. Um, so I think that is an area that across all cancers carries weight. Um, but in those cancers specifically that need additional therapies, like you know rectal cancer, standard of care is neoadjuvant chemotherapy and radiation. A lot of bladder cancers get neoadjuvant therapy as well. Um, those are types of disease sites where, uh, and unfortunately, inequity, inequity, inequities exist and need to be um, focused on. Now, in terms of your uh, first question about COVID in the clinic setting, I think post COVID now, I think, you know, during COVID, um, there was a lot of restrictions. No family members were allowed to come with patients, um, which I think was a difficult thing for a lot of patients to absorb this diagnosis with no one around and them being on the phone was a lot different than, than, than them being in person. Um, but now uh, things have, have opened a little bit more and, you know, family members can come in and people still have to wear masks and there's still a lot of precautions that have to uh, happen. But um, by and large, the majority of um, um, the clinic post or uh, post COVID, but in this setting now of our new era of COVID has been a little bit more um, easier to navigate. Thank you. Uh, th those are really fascinating answers. I never considered how uh, how much uh, transportation and access to transportation might affect your ability to actually continue treatment. Thank you, doctor, for such a uh, you know amazing answer. It was really brilliant. So, for the next question, I'll be passing the mic on to Muskan. Hello, doctor Reddy. First of all, I'd like to thank you for such an amazing talk and such an amazing lecture. So, my question to you really is: since pancreatic cancers can be extremely difficult to diagnose, and many times patients don't know about their diagnosis until it's very late, how do you think we can prevent such a scenario? And how do you think we can create an awareness in the general public so as to ensure uh, timely intervention? Thank you so much. Yeah, that's a great question. That's a weighted question because the idea of sort of identification of pancreatic cancer before it gets to the point that the majority of patients present, I think is one of the most kind of hotly sort of studied topics now, right? The idea of a biomarker. Can there be some magical biomarker that can identify who's at risk? As of right now, the best way is to just be cognizant of symptoms, right? And having a good primary care infrastructure, um, you know, weight loss, nausea, vomiting, abdominal discomfort, chalky stools, dark urine. Those are such subtle things in some capacity, but that carries with a great weight. And just being sort of the frontline primary care doc is probably the most important person in, in your care that will trigger more of a workup. Because when somebody comes in, oftentimes they're jaundiced or there's symptoms that have progressed for quite some time. And you're right that by that time point, metastasis could have happened. It could be locally advanced, et cetera. So trying to catch it in that sweet spot is really the most difficult thing to sort of capture and do. Um, but I think people are becoming more aware of the disease. Now, a lot of it is because of, you know, what's in the mainstream media. So recently, Alex Trebek um, with Vader Ginsburg. Um, uh, Congressman John Lewis. I mean, there's been some notable um, people in the media that have uh, been very open about their diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. And I believe that really has opened up a lot of eyes uh, about this disease. Thank you, sir, for such a... Uh... Thank you, doctor, for such an educational answer. So for the next question, I'll be passing the mic on to Madhuri. Thank you so much, Dr. Reddy, for this amazing presentation and for taking the time to answer really great questions. So my question is, uh, we know how important it is to understand patients and their um, 
history for certain selections of procedures and treatments. So what are the factors uh, for which a patient can be suitable or can undergo the CRS HIV EC therapy? I'm sorry, what, what type of therapy? The, the cytoreductive surgery with HIV EC. Oh, high pack. Oh, so that's really sort of uh, not done in pancreatic cancer. Um, cytoreductive surgery in high pack <clears throat> is an operation that is um, done for mostly appendiceal cancers um, or metastatic colon cancers. Um, um, but for pancreas and specifically, there's uh, no indication or role for that type of surgery because um, the role or the, 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 the biology of pancreatic cancer is much more systemic um, as opposed to sort of local within the perineal cavity in that capacity. So um, for that disease alone, there is no role for cytoreduction. Thank you, doctor, for such a uh, incredible answer. For the next question, I'll be passing the mic to Dr. Jan. How are you? So thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, we are, in, as some would say, on the renaissance of oncology with the advent of, amino, of aminotherapeutics. I wanted to get your take of where you envision uh, immunotherapy in the landscape, both in the present and in the future of pancreatic cancer therapy and how you envision, if at all, the interplay of immunotherapies, chemo immunotherapies, and surgical therapies all acting synergistically in the future uh, for the treatment of pancreatic cancer. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. That's a great question. In fact, I just on Thursday had a meeting with my lab members asking that specific question. Um, you know, there's been trials in PDAC um, where immunotherapy has just not come out like it has in melanoma or the lung world or the renal cell world. And, you know, the, the rationale and the reason ends up being is that, and, and this is where the microenvironment of pancreatic cancer is so pivotal. The microenvironment of this disease is just, just think of like a Trojan horse, right? It, it, the shell of the disease is so tough to break down. So we actually have a clinical trial here looking at specific drugs to sort of modulate the stroma. So our hypothesis is that if we can modulate the stroma, allow for entry, perhaps there is a role for immunotherapy, immunochemotherapeutic agents, et cetera. Um, you know, one thing that we're talking about here is trying to figure out also viruses, right? So there's a lot of talks with, with viruses in terms of, can we give the tumors a cold to allow them to weaken down to then deliver therapies? So while the preliminary or early data on immunotherapy for pancreas hasn't necessarily sort of panned out, I'm not crossing that off the list. I think that there's opportunities here to use it, but we have to break down that door first to get to that point. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, doctor, for such an insightful answer. For the next question, I'll be passing the mic on to Gayatri. Uh, thank you so much, doctor. So another question I had is um, how important of a factor is obesity in, for example, selecting potential candidates for undergoing uh, procedures like the Whipple procedure? Yeah, um, so obesity has, has two sort of um, um, things that you have to worry about. <clears throat> so medical fitness is such an important part of, um, of your general health, you know, in, in general, um, add that to an operation that is a technically demanding, uh, possibly morbid operation, weight does play a role. So um, I think that the specific role that it plays in this situation, that there's other comorbid conditions that are usually associated with obesity, hypertension, diabetes, et cetera, pulmonary issues, um, obstructive sleep apnea. Those are the things that um, sometimes can make surgery more difficult especially the recovery. So the short answer is obesity plays a pivotal role in terms of the post-operative recovery, but a lot of it is the fact that when somebody does have obesity, they have other comorbid conditions that make them higher risk. Thank you, doctor, for that answer. So I have a question. Until now, the best treatment for pancreatic cancer is considered a combination of surgery radiation and chemotherapy. 
you think there's a bright future for alternative treatment plants for pancreatic cancer since there's been like a lot of development in certain treatments such as anti-angiogenesis factor? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the and this is kind of goes to, to Jan's uh, comment, um, the role for pancreatic cancer, listen, I, as much as I would love to say that I will be the end all cure all of this disease, surgery plays an important role, but it's not the individual that plays a role in this disease, it's the team. And I can't emphasize that enough, the true multidisciplinary team, medical oncology, radiation oncology, surgical oncology, and then our scientists, right? That's the team that will make a dent in this disease. So there are so many new therapeutics out there, drugs that are gonna be developed, et cetera, I mean, drug development in pancreatic cancer is one of the hottest fields right now because we're looking at ways to sort of deliver drugs to tumors to kill the tumors. We know that the surgery doesn't change very much, but what we could do to enhance that fibrosis, that tumor kill, all those things before we get to surgery is going to enhance patient survival. Thank you so much, doctor. For the next question, I'll be passing the mic on to Muskan. Hello, Dr. Reddy. So my second question to you is, looking back on your successful career, is there anything that you would perhaps change? And if so, how and why? That's a good question. Um, so when I started my, my career, I, um, I did a lot. Um, I did a lot of different surgeries, and I was a general surgical oncologist with the focus on pancreas, but um, I don't know if I would change anything. I think everything that I've learned up until this point has been for a good reason. And, you know, the tough part about pancreatic surgery is that you need to know a lot of other things as well. And I think I was fortunate enough to be able to do a lot of different types of surgeries, gastric, liver, I was doing HIPEC, melanoma, sarcoma, to really understand the biology of cancer. And every disease has a different biology. And I think the one thing that I think I take most um, to heart is that every cancer deserves a chance. And whether it's breast, colon, pancreas, et cetera, we need the same infrastructure, the same resources for each of these diseases because people are afflicted by them. And um, unless we really kind of work together as a team, we won't make those incremental moves that we need to. Thank you, doctor. That was such an incredible and an inspiring answer. For the next question and the last question, I will be passing the mic on to Madhuri. Thank you so much, doctor, for your amazing answer and thank you for this really presentation. For my second question, for more of our junior attendees who are just getting into research and medicine, what inspired you to pursue this field? And has it been everything that you initially anticipated? That's a great question. So um, a little backdrop. My, my dad's a surgeon and my mom's an anesthesiologist. So for me, um, medicine has always been personal. Um, I've seen sort of firsthand growing up the, the, the good, the pitfalls, the, the benefits, et cetera, of, this, of, 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 of just surgery in general. And the most important thing kind of starting out is mentorship. And, uh, you know, that's hard. And I think that understanding that there's a whole world out there of people that are willing to help and um, centers that do things that um, are impactful is important. But what I could tell all the junior attendees out there is the most important thing is to just find a mentor, find somebody to help you and move you along the way. Um, there are no limits. Uh, if you want it, you'll get it. And um, wherever you are, whatever country you're at, there's always the ways, always the ability to sort of move in the direction you want to move in. Cancer in general is always moving and there's things changing in the research lab. That's probably the best kind of place to start because if you truly have a passion, especially for cancer, a lot of it is in the lab and the research of it. And then it gets extrapolated into sort of the clinical space and marrying the research and the clinical side of medicine is one that I cannot tell how important it is and how rewarding it is. Because when I see a patient in, in, in the office, you know, I always tell patients about clinical trials and, and they in this disease really enjoy knowing that their tumors are being banked, 
their tumors are being used to help future research. Um, they feel as though they're making an impact. And it's because of patients like that and that attitude that makes this so rewarding. Thank you, doctor, for such an amazing answer. A huge thank you to our speaker for an amazing session. Thank you all for the great questions and all our attendees. Please follow the continuous.